Amen. Amen. Hey, before you sit down today, give somebody a high five and tell them, Happy Birthday, Hedgeway. Would you do that? Give them a high five. Tell them, Happy Birthday, Hedgeway. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we want to say happy birthday to the church today. Everyone remember, you remember where you were when you heard Elvis died? It's a simple question. It's like yes or no. Do you, do you remember, do you remember where you were when Elvis, do you remember where you were when the Challenger exploded, the space shuttle? Do you remember where you were at 9-11? There you go. Well, 18 years ago, on this day, the last Sunday in the, of August, I think we've got a slide we can bring up, and we can show you we were gathered right there at the Ludwig Community Center for our first service. We had about 14, 15 folks, and some of them are still with us, like Larry and Iris and, and Lisa and Sister Betty. They're still hanging out with us 18 years later. So let's tell uh, Hedgeway Church, happy birthday. And, and thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. 18, 18 years of God's faithfulness, and we praise the Lord for that. He's been, uh, he's been super faithful, and uh, we cannot praise Him enough for His goodness on display and in all of our lives. So uh, thank you for being here today and uh, for celebrating what, what God has done in your life. And, and uh, maybe, maybe it's your first time here. I saw some first-time guests coming in. So home folks, let's make the first-time guests uh, welcome today. Say thank you for being with us. We appreciate you so very much. And last Sunday, we had a Connect class. I had some folks interested in joining the church. So we had Connect class over at Seth and Emily's house. And uh, we ate and talked and just hung out. And uh, some folks uh, were wanting to join the church. We have one family that's not here today. they got a couple of sick kids. And they've already, they've already texted us and said, we're in. Call us, uh, call us new members. So if you were at Connect class last Sunday and you want to be a member, would you stick your hand up? At this time, just raise your hand, and uh, there's one, and there's one, okay, and I'll do two for the other folks. Let's welcome them on board as brand new members. Yep, 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 yep. We appreciate you guys uh, vesting your life with us and doing life with us. And, uh, you know, we, we at, the, at the Connect class, we, we tell them that we pledge our lives to them and, and that we will, uh, we will be there with them and, and walk through stuff with them. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be their pastors and, uh, and they'll, be our, they'll be our buddies and we'll, we'll do this thing together. So we appreciate that. We're always, we're always uh, amazed uh, when people join the church. It just, it just blows me away. And we appreciate you vesting your lives with us. There's a lot to do, a lot of work to be done, a lot of people that still uh, don't know the Lord as their Savior. So we got a lot of junk going on. I want to say thanks to everyone who came out Wednesday night to the fair. Our praise and worship team was there at the pavilion doing some, doing some worship on Wednesday night. And man, we had a great crowd. I mean, we filled up the pavilions and the little, and the little bleacher things and everything. And the uh, praise and worship team did a fantastic job. And we just had a great time. Thank you all for coming out and representing and, uh, and just having a fun time. Man, we, we sang and we clapped and then we went and ate corn dogs and road rides. I mean, I'm kind of thinking maybe we just need to either move church out there all the time or buy a bunch of rides and concessions to put around this building. Whatever's easier works for me. But we, we had a great time in the Lord and we appreciate you uh, being with us so very much. Uh, today, right after service, is one of our main fundraisers of the year. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not raising funds to spend here at the church, but for Thanksgiving, our women's ministry, the Divas, uh, they, they supply, they supply uh, Thanksgiving dinner for, last year was 120 families, about, about 120 families, wasn't it? So we're going to feed again this year at least that many, maybe more, we don't know, uh, but the money that they raise today from their barbecue dinner right after service goes to offset the price of all those hams. We give away a whole bunch of hams. So after service, do not go get a taco this time. Don't, don't go to Taco. Don't go to South Park. Don't go to any of them places. Uh, they're going to walk through that door. They're going to walk right through that door, and you're going to get a barbecue sandwich or a hot dog because everyone doesn't like barbecue. The the communists and a bunch don't like don't like barbecue, and uh, and there'll be there'll be hot dogs for the kids, barbecue and chips and a drink and a pickle and a cookie for 
Five bucks. It's for five bucks. You can't beat that deal anywhere. So we appreciate your participation in that as we raise funds going into the season where we minister in a lot of different ways to a lot of different folks. And we appreciate you for that so very much. Let's get the uh, serve team to come forward at this time and we'll receive an offering. I will tell you in advance, especially for those that are our guests today, that your giving doesn't stop here. At Hedgeway Church, we in turn, we, we, we sow that seed again and, and we support ministers, ministries, missionaries, all of them that are our friends. We, we're not going through a missions board. They, they are all our buddies. They are all people that we know and we minister side by side with. And uh, it's, it's a privilege to have people out ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. Straight up inner city ministries, Greg and Margaret Murphy, North Little Rock, Arkansas. We, uh, we have a mission at Hemlock Courts, second location called the Daniel House in another neighborhood where we're ministering to, uh, to kids and, and their parents uh, in downtown North Little Rock. And uh, I tell you what, many kids are being born again and we praise the Lord for that. And uh, it's because you guys are givers that we're able to do that. Uh, we're back to feeding on the backpack program uh, uh, at the local schools. And that's ha that happens because you guys are participating in that. We've got the, the Molers in Scotland. We, we've got the Andersons in Albania. We've got Joe and Jesse and another brand new baby they just had in Thailand. I think Seth is sharing some information about Joe and Jesse this morning that's really exciting. So all of that is taking place. We hang out with Churches for Life, Water for Life, drilling water wells in third world countries, WE and ARC planting churches locally and around the globe. All that happens because you guys are givers, and we appreciate your giving so very much. We, we, we don't tell you thank you enough, but we try to tell you thank you every Sunday. Let's get Charlie to pray this morning. Good morning. Anybody watch the, uh, is it on? Yep. yep. Anybody watch the Mayweather fight last night, McGregor? Stayed up? Yep. I went over to my grandson's house, and I did a little research for all went thinking two or three free fights before the thing. I thought, it won't be too late. So I get over there, and Chris is like, oh, no, there's like eight fights. I'm like, no way. <laughs> yeah, there was. There was like eight fights before the fight. And I think, what was it, a little after 11, we fired up. It got into the 10th round. It was interesting. It was entertaining. But money, well spent. Where else could you go spend $100 and see that kind of show? So, hey. Razorback game is even better. Yeah, good. Everybody ready for football? Yeah. Football season? Yeah. You know, if I'd have been thinking about it, Pastor, we could have had Battle of 64 Day at church today. We got Lamar people here. Is that what, Wednesday night? So we can still do it Wednesday night, can't we? We can still come out and support our Panthers and the Warriors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go Panthers. No, go Warriors. Everybody's going. Go, it's, Hey, we we'll expect a good, clean football game. And <laughs> as long as the Panthers win, it all is good. Uh, you know. I had to say, my grandson's a Panther. I'm sorry. Get some to come. Yeah. Do what? Oh, they are. That'll get that'll get even Friday night. We're good. <laughs> oh, I better pray, or uh, I'm gonna get some orange eggs or something in the face. Here we go. Father, we praise you for a wonderful day. We praise you for an opportunity to come to Hedgeway Church today with friends and family. We thank you for your goodness every day, Father. We praise you for your amazing grace and your finished work on the cross, Father. And Lord, what it means to us as Christians today in our life, not only we're saved from hell, Father, but we're saved from life, Father. We, we walk with you. You're the Lord of our life, and we praise you for it every day. Thank you, Lord, today that we can give. We know we can give because you bless us every day. We praise you for blessing us, Lord, and we just look forward, Lord, to going out and being able to bless others, and you bless us, and we'll always praise you for the goodness.
it's it's hard to believe that everything is wrapped up and tied up in, in the kingdom of God in a response of love that Jesus did on the cross. But he even summed it up that way when they came to him, you know, always trying to jack with him and try to trip him up. What's the greatest commandments? And he said, well, you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said, and the other commandment is kind of like it. You love your neighbor like yourself. And then he capped it off with this. He said, on these hang all the law and the promise. Everything hangs on this. That God responded in love towards us. We respond in love towards Him. And we respond in love towards each other. That, that's just, I know, you're going, that's just too simple. I know it. But we ain't got to figure it out yet. It's simple and we still struggle with it, don't we? I'm glad the Lord doesn't struggle with it. We want to agree with you in prayer today. Uh, we know that there's stuff going on in your life. But before we do that, we want to give the Lord a praise. We had folks in for tests and things going on uh, last week. And uh, uh, Paul came back. Everything's good with his heart. And Lisa's test came back. There is no cancer in Lisa. There is no cancer. Yeah. 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 It was a good week. It was a good week. And we've been uh, praising the Lord all week long for the good reports. And you say, well, I got stuff coming up, but we want to believe with you too. Yes. And, and you say, yeah, my report, didn't, my report didn't come back as good. It's not over. It's not over. We're, we're still believing and we're still, we're, we're still affirming God's Word into your situation. No matter what it is, no matter what. It may not be a health thing. It may be a relational thing. It may be a financial thing. It may be a spiritual. It doesn't matter. Jesus is the complete package. What he did, paid it all, period. He paid it all. And so we want to agree with you because that's what the word says we're to do. We're, agree, we're, we're walking with you guys. And we're in this thing with you guys together. All of us together. We're in all this together. We do life together. We do death together. What we do, we do together. And we want to agree with you today as the Lord ministers life into situations that look like only death and light into darkness and peace into chaos. That's our God. So if you've got stuff going on, would you stick a hand up so we can agree in prayer with you? Father, we just praise you today and we thank you, Lord, today. We take a moment to worship and to thank you for the great reports, the, the positive results last week. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for ministering, health and healing and miracles. We praise you, Lord, for being there for your kids, blessing them, ministering to them, walking with them every step of the way, Lord. We thank you for this church and the people that walk together, that, that believe together. Lord, I thank you for that. Father, I, I just affirm your word into every situation today. Your word tells us that when we come together in corporate worship and in corporate prayer, that there's nothing that can stand before you. And today, Lord, we agree as touching these things as you minister physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially, relationally, as you move in every need, Lord, in this congregation or related to this congregation. Father, we praise you as you minister your word, as you do what you do. We praise you today, Lord, as you show yourself strong as you turn these challenges into opportunities for your glory, as you pull a Romans 8, 28, and all things begin working together for the good because they love you, Lord, because they serve you, because you belong to them. It may look bad right now, but it will turn. It will turn, and it will be good. We're claiming that, Lord. We're praising you for that. We're affirming that today. Affirming that today. In Jesus' name, would you guys say amen? amen? Would you guys sing a little more of the chorus, please? 
Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? Good. Look, Charlie left his mic on. We got to practice mic etiquette with Charlie. We have batteries dead all over this place. We turn him on now, not because y'all want to hear him, but because our our live feed. Nobody. It's like he gets up here and they're trying to read lips and they don't know. I, they somebody commented one time said, "Did I did I hear Charlie say he walks his cat?" And I said, "No, you did actually hear him say that one Sunday that Charlie walks his cat." And then he sent me a video because I thought he was crazy. But his cat really does go on walks with him. It's the most amazing cat I've ever seen in my life. So uh, if you ever need to know how to train your cat, go talk to, you know, talk to Charlie Dunlap. I didn't know that was a thing, but his cat goes on walks with their dog. It's really phenomenal. It is, uh, I'm putting in my miracle book, actually. Like, I don't have anything, but I'm going to put in there Charlie's cat walks with them. So it's really awesome. It's really awesome. Uh, if you guys are first-time guests, I'm Seth Alexander. Uh, I get to get to be the executive pastor here, and today... I get, to, I get to come up and communicate with you guys and talk to you for just a moment because I'm, I'm the shortest-winded person out of all of them. Amen? Do you all know how this works? If you don't say amen, like, then I talk for like an hour and a half. So we're going to try this one more time. I'm the shortest-winded out of all of them. All right, yeah. All right, let's go eat barbecue. That was it. Like, you all did it. You passed the test. You passed the test. Um, we have been in our study this year about God is on the move and everyday miracles. But before I get into what I wanted to say, I did want to show y'all something. Will you pull up the slide that I put in there? Here's a slide. That's a slide of devotionals. That is a slide of the devotionals that Joe in Thailand, he wrote. Now, if you heard last week, if you were with us last week, you would have heard that Joe and Jesse, they're some of our missionaries in Thailand. They're, they're very near and dear to us like all of them are. I actually grew up basically with Jesse and her sister, so they're kind of like family to me personally. And Joe wrote a 365-day devotional, first ever, as far as they know, first person to write a Thai devotional, that is Thai. They, they translate them all day long, but never has somebody ever written one that is a Thai person. I was going to tell you what, because I know you're wondering, what does that say on the front of it? Here's what it says when you translate it to English. It says, walking with God, 
365 days in the Word of God. So that is a picture right there. When you guys give every every Sunday, when you guys give and we're able to bless them monthly with your giving, this is what it's going to. I mean, this is a this is amazing. I mean, do you understand? Like nobody in Thai has ever written a Thai devotional. Like we know personally know the very first person to write a Thai devotional to the Thai people in their language. That's incredible. That is incredible. But we wanted to share that with y'all because it is that important to us, and we want you guys to know because it's all because of your giving those kind of things take place. You can bring my, my slide back up for what I'm going to talk today with y'all about. Um, my message today is kind of entitled, Promise Greater Than Process, or Is the Process Greater Than the Promise? Um, we're going to unpack that, that today. We're going to look at that. But like I said, we've been, in the, we've been in our study this year about God is on the move and our tagline of everyday miracles. And what we've looked at is there's three areas that happen well, as we began to look at this this year. It inspires us for worship. It always raises our expectations. And it empowers us for service. So we spent the first half, you know, trying to just see those everyday miracles. And then we've been looking at the proper response in the miracles um, of what's going on. And we've seen God do some amazing things as we've been going through the book of Matthew. We've watched him, you know, open blinded eyes. He's, he's healed wounded limbs. Uh, let's see, he, you know, he, he took away skin disease. There was food shortage that he took care of. He walked, uh, he walked on crazy water in some crazy weather situations. You know, God, God has done it all. Jesus has done it all. But all these areas... They all had something in common. They were all in need of a miracle, but they were also all a desperate situation. Because we learned early on, for a miracle to take place, there has to be a reason for the miracle to happen. It's not that we can do it on our own, but it's when we're fully relying on God. See, all of these are promises. All of these are promises from God, but they're also, as we started looking at last week, some more. We've been looking at it, but we really kind of hit on it some more last week. They're all also a process. So to stay in our, in, in our theme of study this year, um, I wanted to look at a couple of things. Now, I'm not going to talk on a specific miracle. We've been looking at specific miracles, and uh, today I'm not going to talk on a specific miracle, but I'm going to stay in the realm of what we started looking at last week whenever, whenever Don broke out once again. He, he looked at the process. What were the steps of the process? They, were, uh, they started with the miracle, and the miracle that we're studying, it points forward to Christ's resurrection. So, for instance, when, when, uh, when he healed the guy of leprosy, he was, he was really speaking about healing us uh, uh, spiritually, right? So there was a physical miracle that pointed towards whatever happened on the day of resurrection. Then the application, it comes through, it comes through our response sometimes to the miracle. Application is through our lives. Your life is the application of God's word in somebody else's life and in your own. And, 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 then, and then we looked at it also brings about transformation. Transformation is always taking place. This is that's the process. That's what's going on. So what is greater in that? Is the process bigger than the promise, or is the promise bigger than the process? To get there, we got to start with something real fast. we got to lay a little bit of groundwork, and we're going to make it quick because pretty soon y'all are going to start smelling the aroma of a barbecue and of freshly grilled hot dogs. You know, these things aren't boiled. They're being grilled as we speak. These dogs, who likes burnt hot dogs? Who likes hot dogs that are not burnt, but they got a little crunch, a little crispiness to the outside. You are all correct. All you other people are wrong. And if you eat them raw with ketchup, I'm going to pray for you. But uh, so here's, here's, here's where we're at. Here's what we got to know. Here's what we got to look at. We got to get something right here when we're looking at the promise and the process, and it starts with our faith. So in Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, if you'll pull that up real quick, here's what it says. This is in, this is in King James. I never read out of King James, not because I don't like it, but I need it because most of the time when I read it, I need it to make sense to me. But this says exactly what I needed to say. This is what it says. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 2 goes on to say, for by it elders obtained a good report. So there are three words in Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 that summarize what, Bible, what the Bible says about faith. We're going to get to verse 3 in a moment. But this is what it says. It says that there's substance that there's evidence, and that there is witness. Now, in that, in that verse, in verse 2 through the King James Version, it says, obtained a good report. In other, in other translations, it, it refers to a witness, okay? So here's what's going on. The word substance means this literally. It means to stand under or to support. Hmm, that's interesting. Faith is to a Christian what a foundation is to a house. It gives confidence and assurance that he will stand. So let me read it like this. Faith is to you what a foundation is to a house. It gives 
you confidence and assurance that you can stand in the process. We have to understand the importance of our faith. So some may say it like this, faith is the confidence of things hoped for, not the, not the substance, but it's the confidence of things hoped for and the assurance that what God promised you will experience. The word evidence simply means this. It means conviction. So we have, we have, uh, we have the three words, substance, evidence, witness. Ev- uh, the word evidence simply means conviction. This is the inward conviction from God that what he promised he will perform. The presence of God-given faith in one's heart is conviction enough that he will keep his word. Witness, I said, obtained a good report, as you've seen in in verse 2, can also be translated to witness. This is very important because in Hebrews 11, it occurs not only in verse 2, but twice in verse 4, once in verse 5, and then again in verse 39. The summary in Hebrews 12 and 1 calls the list of men and women so great a cloud of witnesses. They are witnesses to us because God witnessed to them. Your witnesses to other because God witnesses to you. In each example, God gave witness to that person's faith. The witness was his divine approval on their life. So the writer of Hebrews, he makes it very clear that faith is a very practical thing. So in Hebrews 11 and 3, if you'll pull up my verse in Hebrews 11 and 3, this is, this is going to be it's going to be through, uh, I believe, the message. It says, by faith, we see the world called into existence by God's word. What we see created by what we don't see. So in spite of what unbelievers say, faith enables us to understand what God does. Because what we're saying is his faith allows us to see things that have not been seen yet. Did you see the picture from 18 years ago in the Ludwig Community Building? When we were packing stuff in and out, and we had like one tiny little amp head that we still own 18 years later, and it still works. It's amazing. PV's awesome. If you need to buy something, I I just suggest them as much as anybody. But uh, we still use it. It's being used right now down that kid's hall. 18 years ago, that's all we had in like what, like one mic, two mics? We had two two mics, you know? I mean, we we had nothing. We had two mics and like 12 people. Like, that was it. We could not see what there was to come, but our faith sustained us. It was our foundation of 18 years ago that you get to come in and sit in comfy chairs and not fold out metal chairs, that you don't come into a musty smelling building because it's shut up all week long and we roll in for an hour and a half on a Sunday, right? You get to come into good air conditioning. Smells, I hope it smells good. It depends. You need to look who you're sitting by. I can't, you know, uh, it smelled good before you got here. Um, But, uh, you know, so it's that kind of faith that it takes to see things come to pass. So, it's unbelievers, they don't understand, but it gives us an understanding of what God does. Faith enables us to see what others cannot see. As a result, faith enables us to do this. Faith enables us to do things that others cannot do. People laughed at these great men and women when they stepped out by faith. They thought they were nuts, but God was with them and enabled them to succeed to his glory. It wasn't for their, it was not for their benefit. Please understand that. Your faith, it is for you, but it is to point others to his glory. Your faith is for his glory. Dr. J. Oswald Sanders, he put it like this. He said, faith enables the believing soul to to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. That's pretty powerful stuff right there. When we get a grasp on what our faith is, we treat things that are not seen as though they are seen. So here's where we get to what's greater, the promise or the process. You have to remember what we just learned about faith, okay? So remember that. Here's where we're at. Um, the process, or the, I'm sorry, the promise comes through the process, but it's activated by our faith. We have to keep ourselves in faith because it's foundational, right? We just read that faith is to you like, like a foundation is to a home. It's what you build on. Your faith is what you build on. So we're going to be using David as an example today on some of the things uh, uh, as we look at promise and process. Because I tell you, David was, was a man that had a great promise, but had a really lengthy process <laughs> and a crazy process. Go read his story. We're not going to unpack all of David's story, but it's, it's insane. How did he get to his promise? And it was through his process. So here's what I need you to do if you're taking notes. I need you to write down. Here's, I've got one, two, three, four, five. Does that make you nervous? Five, six, seven. I've got seven, I've got seven letters. I've got seven letters 
seven words, really, that I want you to write down, okay? Word number one, are you ready? Process, that's where we're going to start. Word number one, process. We are all in an ongoing process. Process isn't something you do for a time or a season, but it's where you live your life. You are in ever-going, ongoing process. You may grow out of one process to simply start another, which that's what, that's what we should do. We should grow in our faith, and we should go from process to process. Process, it really isn't a bad word. When we say we are in process, that simply means God's working on us, but also as we've been looking at this year about, about these miracles is it's not just the miracle God brings to us, it's the miracle God wants to bring through us. So when we're in process, God just isn't working on us, but he's working through us to reach other people. Without process, there is never progress. All right, so we got process. Second word, you ready? Response. This is what we've been looking at lately, right? We've been looking at the process. We've been looking at the response to these miracles. Now, I've gotten the opportunity to, to come and speak to you all a couple times about some responses in Matthew to some of the miracles, and I'm really, really good at looking at how they get to the wrong response. Like, I look at it, and initially when I read, when I read what's going on, I never see anybody have the right response. It's always like, they did it all wrong. You know, because that, 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 is, that is me. That's my flesh. Like, I just, I respond to how they do it wrong because this is my problem. Can I tell on myself a little bit? And if you'd be honest with yourself, this may, be, this may be you too. Sometimes, sometimes I see people's flaws a whole lot quicker than I see where they excel at something. Sometimes I look at people and I, it's, it's, what, it's what they do wrong that drives me crazy and I never look and see what they do right. They could do one thing wrong and five things right, and I'm focused on that one thing they're doing wrong. Why do I do that? It's the world we live in. Do you watch the news? I don't really watch the news. Where's Alan at? He's my newsman. Me and Alan were talking about that the other day. Alan watches the news. Alan keeps me kind of up to date and in line, uh, just like he does Lori. Right, Alan? Yeah. So uh, I'm just kidding. Hey, you guys, are y'all okay? Loosen up a little bit. Are you okay? It's okay. You can actually laugh. Laughing sounds like this. Ha ha. It's okay. You can do that. And you can do it and not mean it. Because when you do that, I just, I get talking faster. And I'm telling you, there's barbecue back there. You're going to want to eat it. Like, I'm just, I'm trying, help me help you. Help me help you. Okay? That's what I'm saying. We're in a world where the news is all the time tabloids, news. I don't, I don't care what you watch, but how often do they celebrate when somebody does something right? It's usually always like, this is what this moron did wrong. But we have to look at people through Christ's love. Because when we look at people through the lens of Jesus, we begin, we begin to see those areas that they succeed. And even better yet, sometimes we see areas where they're not succeeding, but we know they can. And we get to come in and invest with them. And we get to watch them grow as they go through the process of when they're trying to reach their promise and their calling. So that's, that's so important. We have to get it right. Our response to the process, it is huge. If we embrace it, we can grow with it, you know, but the process is a funny thing. When we fight it, sometimes it becomes our biggest stumbling block. Sometimes it holds us up and it halts us. It keeps us bound down. But however, when we embrace it, it can become our launching pad. It can be the thing that promotes you the furthest, the fastest. With the right response, what feels like, like something that you're stuck in, that feels like something that's, that's got you held down and tied up, it could be the very thing that releases God's greatest promise in your life. All right, third word, opportunity. So we've recognized the process and we've talked about having the right response and how it's so important. So now we're staring opportunity dead in its face. We are looking at opportunity eyeball to eyeball. Here is where we start separating needing a Savior and declaring God Lord of our lives. Do you remember last week we were talking about that? We were talking about the difference in simply saying that you need a Savior and, and, and really declaring God Lord of your life. Lordship is a major deal. It is nothing to be taken lightly. It is something to really, really understand when you confess that. Because when you confess God Lord of your life, you are relinquishing control of what you're doing with yourself. You know, you are giving that, you are saying, God, your plan is better than my plan. You're not just trying to skip out on some hardship, but you're really allowing him to reign and rule over your life. When, you, when we devote our lives fully to God, opportunity begins to knock at our door. Now, 
opportunity doesn't always come dressed all spiffy like Ray was this morning when he was opening doors for y'all, huh? Did y'all like Ray this morning in his purple shirt? Looking good. My man, Brother Ray down there, Sister Karen, opening doors for y'all. All my greeters doing a great job opening doors, you know. Everybody, when they, when they shake your hand and they hug your neck, we pray every Sunday morning before you come in this door that we hug your neck and we mean it when we love you. Man, it gets me, guys. Because that is what changes lives. That's, that's what changes lives when we're authentic with people and when we break down those walls of just going, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. Had a good week? Yeah. And you had the worst week of your life. You were waiting on test results, and you didn't know what was going to go on. And you needed to know that somebody, you could come in, and they was just a love on you. That is doing church. That's what being the body of Christ is about. Why, where is opportunity in that? I don't really know. I don't really know where I got off on opportunity like that. But I also wanted to say one of our newest members serving at the church Oh, uh, California Gary up there running the running the, the live feed. Everybody, we got to get people in here with different names. You guys are wearing me out with the Dinas and the Debras and the Garys and the Bobs and the like. Come on, like go by middle name or just lie to me and tell me your name something else because I got to call him California Gary so I know which Gary I'm talking about. You know, like I'm gonna just y'all got nicknames that you don't even know about and some of them I'm probably not gonna tell you to your face. Hello, just say him. But uh, I'm, I'm kidding, guys. Hey, we love you, right? You come in, we give you hugs. We love you. So uh, remember that. Remember that. So opportunity, it knocks at your door, but it sometimes comes dressed like, not a great word, like work. Sometimes it comes looking a lot like serving. You go, well, what does opportunity look like to you sometimes, Seth? Well, here's what it, here's what it could come looking like. Maybe... Maybe it involves something that looks like it's below you. It's a menial task, but sometimes opportunity knocks and it scares you to death. It looks like it's way too big for you. You're going, what is this? Lord, this is an opportunity you meant. That's supposed to be like three doors down to somebody else. That's not my opportunity. My opportunity is supposed to be a lot smaller. Sometimes opportunity, opportunity it can intimidate you, but maybe it's chasing kids down a kid's hall and scrubbing markers off a table when they don't keep it on the paper, or changing Dirty diapers in the nursery. Oh, bless you people that do that. Maybe it's carrying an umbrella in a monsoon when people are trying to get in from their cars, you know? And you're, you're squeaking shoes the rest of the Sunday. Squash, squash, you know, water's just spraying out of your shoes. Maybe it's running a camera for a live feed or twisting knobs on a soundboard so that y'all can hear me. And when I talk too long, Josh mutes me, and I know that's when I'm supposed to shut up, right? Maybe it's taking out the trash after everybody comes in and eats those awesome biscuits and gravy or or the smoked sausage biscuits, or those really good fried potatoes. And if you're not getting here early enough for that, please stay home because it's more for me. So uh, I'm just kidding. Y'all need to get here. You need to eat with us. You need to hang out with us because it's so good. But maybe that's, what, maybe that's what opportunity looks like for some of us. You know, Jesus let kids crawl all over him. He loved kids, man. He loved for them to come up and just get up all in his business. Jesus, would he walked out on waters and hurricane force winds. He didn't even have to hold umbrellas. He just... Skimmed right across the top of the surface. He washed feet of his disciples, and he hung out with people that were of all kinds of social backgrounds, the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. Jesus knew nothing too big, nor did he know anything too small. He never discounted or discredited any opportunity that made his way towards him. And I pray that I don't do the same, and I pray that you would not do the same either. Because there will be a time when, when my opportunity or your opportunity, that's someone else's blessing. When we allow that opportunity to knock on our door and we don't embrace it because we think that's not big enough or we think that's too big, that's somebody's blessing wrapped up right there. That's where you get to become more than yourself. That's where we get to do this together. In those moments, that's where, that's where ministry starts taking place in those, in those opportunities. So we love because... Christ first loved us. We serve because he first served us. That, that's referring to that thing about being a great cloud of witnesses. You get to be that to people. All right. What are we on? We're on the fourth word. Word number four. You ready? Ministry. Ministry. Did you get it? Everybody say it with me. Ministry. Okay. Not everyone has a title in front of their name that says pastor. Did you know that? Did you wake up this morning and realize that in front of your name it didn't say pastor? Did you get that? Or anything, you're like, that's a, okay. Well, here's what you might not have known. However, even though in front of your name, it does not say pastor, whatever, 
we all have a ministry. We are all Jesus to somebody. Husbands, I've been a husband for like seven years and some odd months. My wife's not in here, so I don't have to get it right. So don't tell her. But we're working on, we're working on year number eight in November. So I've not been a husband very long because I told the joke about, you know, wives, you swish water in your mouth. Who, anybody remember that? Anybody remember that words of wisdom? I feel like, yeah. Ben, ben raised his hand because Becky's not sitting beside him, but it's okay. It's all right, Ben. I'm sorry to call you out like that in front of everybody. But uh, so I, I've only been married like seven years, seven and a half years, and it's been awesome. But here's what I've learned in my, in my short marriage, that husbands, you are the spiritual head of your household. I don't care if you like it or not. That's your job. Suck it up, put on your boots, and get to work. You're the spiritual head of your household. Your wife looks at you to lead her, not by pulling her along and dragging her behind you, not by running over her when she's in front of you. She looks for you to lead her with love, care, and compassion like Christ does the church. Now, wives, I want to fill you in on something real fast. If your husband's sitting beside you right now, I need you to look at him because I need you to tell something about, I, I, I'm going I'm to share some really deep insight about your husband right this moment. Are you ready? He is not perfect. I know it's a shock to you, and you're really having a hard time right now. I know you're having a hard time, and I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but your husband is not perfect. Now, he shoots for perfection, but we always miss. And here's the deal. We need a little bit of compassion, just like twice a year, right? We only mess up usually about two times a year. It's like summer and, and, and winter usually. like We do spring and fall pretty well. But, so we're going to mess up twice a year. And in those times, we need a little bit of compassion because sometimes the moments of trying to be that spiritual leader and lead that household, they feel that weight. Even when you're bearing it with them, they know ultimately that responsibility is on their shoulders. You are your husband's biggest blessing. I, husbands, that's where you look at your wife and you say, that's right, you are my biggest blessing. Like, come on, guys. Do it now. I'm telling you, if you don't, it's hard to chew barbecue with no teeth, okay? Like, do it now. You cannot slurp barbecue through a straw. I don't care how talented you are. All right? <laughs> oh, man. That was not in my notes at all. Like, that just came right off the cuff, and it was, it was timely. It was needed. That was Jesus-inspired. You know, our wives are our biggest blessings, and they offer they're the one person that can offer that encouragement in that biggest time where we need it. They can see through our facade and our front. And wives, you can encourage us at just the right moment when we need it. Husbands, when we do it right, we would lay our lives down for our wife and for our family. It, this goes for our children as well. Got a little old blonde-headed kid running around here. She's crazy, and I love her to death, and sometimes I want to string her up by her feet because, I mean, she just goes nuts sometimes. And I'm just like, who, who are you? Where, where did you come from? Like a year ago, you were fine. Now you're crazy. What is wrong with you? You know, like that's, y'all don't do that? Y'all are lying. I, I see some of y'all nodding your head like, yes, we, we did that like five minutes ago. Luckily, we dropped them off in nursery. That's why we have, that's why we have stuff like that for y'all. Because you know what? This, is, this might be your only time to catch a nap. So please close your eyes and rest. It's okay. This is on Facebook Live. You can catch it later on down the road. It's not a big deal. You will not offend me. Just don't snore too loud because I don't yell a lot. Like, I don't get red-faced and yell so it, it can distract other people. But so that's how we have, that's how we have, ministry starts at our house. That's how we have to start our ministry is at home with our wives, with our family, with our kids, with our mom and dad, with whatever. And maybe you're going, I'm not married. Well, that's okay. You have plenty of time. Or maybe it starts at work. Maybe it's someone that doesn't know Jesus. Maybe they don't attend church. This is great because here's what I'm going to tell you right this very moment. If they know you go to church, you have just been promoted to Jesus in their life. Like they're watching you. They're looking at you. They want to know how you're going to respond to certain situations. How do, how, you know, how do you deal with this situation at work when you get upset and you get frustrated? Are you always calm and cool? Absolutely not because you're human, but it's okay. It's not that you mess up in front of them. It's, that, it's just that you're aware that you are someone's Jesus in that very moment. Here's what's important, though. Sometimes it's not just our actions, but sometimes it's our words. See, there's no pressure, no, no pressure on you, but uh, uh, somebody's eternity could be 
in your very hands and in your very mouth. What you say could affect somebody's eternity. See, ministry isn't standing in this area or if you're Don, in this whole area. Like in this area over here, and in, and in this, that feels pretty good. I'm gonna I'm gonna start working on my. I'm gonna start running back and forth. Y'all just not even gonna know. Y'all, ain't, I'm gonna be. I almost went outside and grilled hot dogs while I gave y'all this message because I forgot Emily had promoted me to hot dog griller today, and I was like, yeah, I can do that. And it dawned on me yesterday. I'm supposed to talk on Sunday, Emily, but we have lapel mics and they reach. So I, I was like, I could just, I could just roll hot dogs around and just go through all this, and they don't have to look at me, but I. Figured y'all wouldn't like that. But ministry isn't just standing on this stage for 25 minutes because you're super fast at talking like I am and we're going to get out of here and we're going to eat uh, barbecue sandwiches and hot dogs. But ministry, ministry is lived out in our everyday, ordinary, repetitive lives. In those moments, that's where ministry takes place. That's what we have to be aware of. All right, here we are. One, two, three, four. We're on, le- we're on word number five. I'm going to tell you a word. This is like 5A, 5B. So put a little slash in there. Intent and integrity. Intent and integrity. Here's where we start really looking at David. In, in 1 Samuel 24, we see David is on the run for his life. He has been for a while, and he's running for his life, and he's hiding out in a cave with all of his warrior guys, and who else but the one man that's hunting him down comes into the same cave they're in. Now, he comes in there to relieve himself. I know you think I'm joking, but I'm not. Pull up the scripture because I don't want you to think I'm a liar. This is out of the message right here. He, we're picking it up in verse 3, he, th- this is Saul. So Saul comes in, right? Preference the story, sorry. David was anointed king a long time ago. Saul's still king. Saul wants to kill him because David's doing some stuff that Saul is not not a big fan of, and people are singing David's praise and all that good stuff. Go back, read it. But anyway, so Saul's trying to kill David. That's the point. David's in process. He's trying to get to his promise of becoming king over Israel. Okay, so I caught y'all up on all that real, real fast. So he, Saul, came to some sheep pens along the road. There was a cave there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. I told you, I'm not a liar. David and his men were huddled far back in the same cave. David's men whispered to him, check it out. They said, they said, can you believe it? This is the day God was talking about when he said, I'll put your enemy in your hands, and you can do whatever you want to with him. Quiet as a cat, David crept up and cut off a piece of Saul's robe. Check out verse 5. Hold on to this. Immediately he felt guilty. He said to his men, God forbid that I should have done this to my master, God's anointed, that I should have so much as raised a finger against him. He's God's anointed. David held his men in check with these words, and he wouldn't let them pounce on Saul. Saul got up, left the cave, and went on down the road. Now the story goes on. David goes out, and, 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 he, and he tells Saul what he did. And Saul recognizes how good of a man David was, intent and integrity. David's effectiveness of his rule as king could have been hanging in the very balance in this moment. If he killed Saul or if he spared Saul, what kind of king David could be was wrapped up in that one moment. See, If you look back, it says that David's men whispered to him, can you believe it? This is the day God was talking about when he said, I'll put your enemies in your hands and you can do whatever you want to with him. Sometimes we have to tune out voices of distraction. People that mean the best that they can, people that are in a sincere place, in a sincere heart, trying to give you direction. When you're in these moments where something could be hanging in the very balance of your decision. And then sometimes you have to tune out your own voice also. Sometimes it's not just shutting out the noise from the world, but it's shutting out the noise from yourself because when you're just constantly, constantly rolling it, mulling it over, chewing the fat on it, sometimes you've got to stop and just listen to what God has to say. See, David's effectiveness of his ministry hung in the balance of this. Mm. Sometimes the right opportunity could mean life or death in your ministry. You all have a ministry. Remember, we all have a ministry. David, David had it right. He knew this. I stole this quote from Stephen Furtick. It's not important that I get there. It's important 
how I get there. What I'm saying is this. There's promises that God has given each and every one of us. There's miracles that we're believing for this year. We all have them. But there's a process to how we get there to them. And it's not necessarily important that we obtain it. Sometimes it's more important how we obtain it. It's not always the timeline. Sometimes it's how we, how we get there. That's so important. You have to keep that, you have to keep that grasp in there. He had a chance that day to take destiny into his own hands. David had the very moment he could take destiny into his own hands. To see that promise come to pass right then. He could relieve the pressure of the process. Have you ever felt the pressure of the process, the pressure of believing for that miracle, the pressure of continually praying and seeking and confessing the outcome that you desire and it's not coming and it's just like, man, it's pressure and it feels like it's bearing down on you and it's pressure and you're just wanting some relief. And right now, David could have relieved that pressure, running for his life, knew what his promise was, could have relieved the pressure, but he chose not to because it was more important how he got there than that he just got there because how he led the kingdom was more important to him than just being king. You know, mm. When we manufacture the results, we maintain the results. When God brings the promise through the process, we get to live out our full calling. Our highest degree of ministry comes through that. It's not just important that we get to the promise. Once again, it's important that we get there the right way. What are our lives saying to those around us? What we have. What are our lives saying to those around us. We may have the right intent. Remember, intent, integrity. You may have the right intent, but if you have really, really poor execution, it could jeopardize your integrity. And it's hard for people to follow someone that has no integrity. When you're Jesus to somebody, when you are his ambassador to somebody on this earth, how you do what you do will paint a picture of what Jesus is to that person. If they're looking for an excuse, they're going to try to find it any way they can in your life. And you may give them one every now and then. But it's like David didn't do everything right. My gosh, David did a bunch of stupid stuff. I mean, a lot of dumb stuff. And God still fulfilled that promise to David because David knew no matter how far down the road he got, he could, he could repent, change his mind, change his way, and put things back where they're supposed to be. Next word, security. What does that mean? It's the state of being free from danger or threat. See, David would go on to become a great king. We know this because he was secure of his promise from God. David did a bunch of really cool stuff, man. He killed bears and lions. You know, he killed Goliath. Uh, he, fought, he fought in many battles and was very, very successful. He played a harp for a guy who had a spear that wanted to kill him. That's an interesting twist. Try that sometime. I can't speak for you, because I, I, I don't know, but uh, I can speak for myself. I've never went to battle with my life on the line. And I sure I've never wrestled off wild animals with my bare hands, although I could do it if I really needed to. So don't worry. Don't pick a fight with me, because I will karate chop you in the neck. David, David had a sense of security in the Lord that made his that made him confident in his calling. He knew the threat was there, but that God's provision was greater. What God promised, what did we read a, a moment ago? What did we look at when we were talking about the promises of God, that, that he is faithful to fulfill what he says he was going to do? See, David knew what his promise was, and he had that confidence that, that, that God's provision was greater than any threat. He took God at, at his word, and he held on to the faith that he would fulfill what he had promised. It's not always easy to stand secure under the promise in our faith. It's not always easy to walk in total boldness and be that person that you feel like you're supposed to be and be that super Christian all the time and go around professing great words of faith and wisdom and prosperity over people. It's not always easy. But here's the shocker. When you don't do it, it does not surprise God. Like, he knows you don't got what it takes to do that 24-7. 365. It's impossible. We are trapped in flesh. He understands. It's not a shock to God when we don't always get it right. Hmm. 
See, David took God at his word, like I said, and he held on to that faith. What have we heard several, several times, not even in this past year, but in in the past few years that Don has said? He has said several times this. What would it look like if you reacted as though the promise was present, as though that miracle was now? What would you react like? Remember, faith is the confidence of things hoped for. When a believer has faith, it is God's way of giving him confidence and assurance that what is promised will be experienced. David knew that. David held on to that. And he went on to be a a great king. Last word, eternal. God's word stands eternal. Our promises stand eternal. The process we go through here points us to the eternal promises of heaven. God gives each believer that promise that they'll never experience eternal separation. There lies our confidence and our security. And if you're here today and you don't have that confidence and that security, it's so easy. He's just waiting for you to place that in his hands and he'll return it to you and he'll give it to you freely because he paid the ultimate price for that. He wants you to have that security in who he is And that he never wants you to be eternally separated. The opportunities we have today may be only experienced when we make it to heaven. There's some opportunities that we seize that we feel like we don't do a good job at. But sometimes those will only be displayed in the light of eternity. We already hit on that someone's eternity could very well be placed in your hands. Or several someone's eternities could be for that instance. What we do will resound for the rest of our lives, guys. And David, he did it right. He didn't get everything right every time, like I said, but he always repented. He always changed his course. He always put things back in place. He set his kingdom up. He set God's kingdom up to go well on past where he even was to bigger and better things. Isn't that always our hope? Is that not always our aspiration that what we build will be able to be built on top of? When we stay in the process and we protect our promise, we set up others to build things only whispered to us by God. They'll be shouted by others. They were whispered to us, but it was our resolve in our promise and in our process that set somebody else up to do those things that were unseen that become realities to people, to other folks. All the way back to Ludwig Community Building on 18 years of being a church, people coming together so that you could be here today. You didn't even know who we were. You may not have even lived around here 18 years ago. I have no idea if you moved in last night. But that 18 years ago, what happened then made it possible for you to be seen today here. And God did all that just for you. Just for You're the reason he did that. I don't know if you realize that, but that's how important you are to God. He'll start a church just for you. He'll put people in place just for you. That's the kind of God we serve. So in light of our study this year about God is on the move and our tagline of everyday miracles, we have to keep our our faith central and we have to keep our, our promises clear. By getting in the word every day and strengthening each other in our relationships. I am huge on relationships. Spend five minutes with me and I will drive you crazy about relationships because we've said it several times. Everything rises and falls on relationships. Our relationships with others, however successful we will be, will be in our relationships with others. That's how successful we will move on. Maybe you're trying to find God in those everyday routine acts, right? We're looking for God's activity, everyday miracles. Man, sometimes you're, you're listening for him to speak words of great wisdom and knowledge to you. Just whisper to your heart or shout it on your phone over the radio in your car or write you a letter in the dew in the grass. I don't know what you expect God to do for you all the time. But sometimes, sometimes, for instance, let's put it in some practical everyday stuff. Sometimes you got a little old kid that you're brushing their teeth and you're combing out that nappy hair. And you're going, where's God at in this everyday morning ritual routine trying to get them ready to get them out the door? Or maybe you're a young person and you roll over and you realize you got 10 minutes to make the first hour and you're like, holy cow, I'm 13 minutes away from school and I got 10 minutes to get there. Where's God at in there? 
Maybe your house is quiet when you wake up because your kids are grown and they're gone. And you miss and you miss those and you miss those times of when they're little. And you're wondering, God, where where's my purpose at now? Where's my promise at now? Now that they're grown and they're gone. And they're living all over the great United States. Where's God's activities in those everyday mundane moments? Well, sometimes here's where I can find it. Sometimes it's in that that sunrise and I see his handiwork. And he doesn't say anything, but I see the display of how great and mighty he is. Sometimes this is the one that gets me. It only gets me because it's where I am in my life. Sometimes it's when I'm coming up that nappy hair on that kid that I want to hang her up by her feet because she's running around and I can't catch her. And I've got three minutes to get out the door and I cannot make a ponytail to save my life. I'm horrible. If you ever see my child with a bad ponytail, it is my fault. I apologize. I love her. I just don't do good at ponytails. Man, sometimes it's when you're brushing out that nappy hair and you're brushing those teeth and you're telling them to stand still and they stop you and you're going, I don't have time for you to stop me. And they say, hey, I love you. You want to find an everyday miracle? There's a miracle. Sometimes, young folks, it's when you're 10 minutes to get to class and you've got a 15-minute drive ahead of you and you're going, God, why am I late for the fourth time this week? Jesus, speak to me in some way to make me be on time. And he says, hey, dipstick, that cell phone, you can set like 95 million alarms. Set an alarm earlier. Who knows? You might wake up. Set like five of them. Can you really sleep through five alarms? I don't know. Maybe you can. I'm not sure. It's real practical ways sometimes that we see those miracles. Sometimes it's when you're missing those kids because they live wherever, raising kids of their own or doing their own career, and they call you up and they tell you how they had a success, how they had a win somewhere, and it was because of those life principles, and it was because you brought them to church, and it's because you modeled Jesus, because you took your ministry home. That's where your everyday miracle's coming from. That's where God's working on stuff every day in our lives. Maybe, just maybe, it's in those underappreciated, undervalued, everyday moment that God is constantly cultivating in you what you need to fulfill your ministry, to see that promise through and to keep you sane through the whole process. Maybe that's where it's at. So we're going to review my five or my however many words. I got seven words real fast. Bring up my slide. Here you go. Number one, process. Where are, we're all here. It's never ending. Number two, response. You got to get it right because it unlocks the door to everything else. Number three, opportunity. Process and response. It's where the opportunity comes from. They get put together. Number four, ministry. We all have one. What will you do with it? Number five, intent slash integrity. Remember, remember, remember. It's not important that I get there. It's important how I get there. Number six, security. God is always with you. He will, he will bring his promise to pass in you. You have to trust the process. You have to trust his timeline. Number seven is eternal. Everything we do has an eternal impact, and that's where our promise lies, is in all those words. That's where our promise comes from. Remember that. All of this is wrapped up in God's promise. He will deliver to you what you need. He will bring those promises to pass in your life if you trust him in the process. Hold to the faith. Remember, maybe, just maybe, it's in those underappreciated, undervalued, everyday moments. God is constantly cultivating. He's constantly working. Your promise is too important to God to not see it come to pass. Why would he birth in you something that he wasn't going to bring to fulfillment? So maybe, just maybe, guys, it's in those everyday moments. That that process that we see those glimpses and we see those pieces and we thank God for, thank God for the pieces that you see. You may not see the full picture yet your promise may not be completed but he's he's working on it and he's working through you because remember it's not the miracle that we get all the time it's the miracle that we that we get to work through into other people's lives 
So hold tight to that, to that promise and stay true to that process. Never compromise your integrity or your intent. Never do it. God wants way, way, way too good of stuff for you to do that. Your ministry can hinge on that. I'm very thankful for what God had me speak today. This is very personal. This was something that I, I, he asked me, do you want to do a miracle? Do you want to do uh, something on your own? Do you want to give him a break from the series or whatever? And I was like, I don't know. I, di I didn't know, and I couldn't come, couldn't come to grips with what I wanted to say because I'm not real awesome like that. It, it, it's not like cut and dry. Um, and I, I kind of honestly, I kind of wanted to do another miracle because we're like following the book of Matthew. So you have scriptures in front of you that you then study and pray on it, and the Lord will speak to you about that. But, man. I'm so thankful that I didn't do that, that I went this route. Because I'm telling you right now, there's some of you in here that you've got some promises that you're holding on to that you're, that, man, they were, they're fading. That you're kind of getting out of, out of perspective. Don't let go of those promises. Just because you're in a process, just because you feel the pressure of the process. You may feel that pressure, but let me encourage you that through those relationships, I'm telling you guys, through those relationships, those folks that are sitting beside you, if it's friends or if it's family, if it's the church, us, come to us. We will help you. We will pray with you. We will believe with you that that promise will come to pass. And you know what? The pressure is alleviated when you're not bearing it by yourself. That's what I got for you today. I got some announcements. Y'all want to hear some announcements? And then we're going to all, all go eat barbecue. Y'all ready for announcements? Yeah? Let's see. This is last week's announcements. Hold on. I got to make some adjustments on the fly. Where are we at? Today's the barbecue dinner. Did y'all know that? Barbecue dinner today. $5 a plate, hot dogs and stuff. September 9th, classics. Uh, that is being postponed right now, but you'll get back with us on that. Uh, at 3 o'clock. It was going to be at the Shaw's, but we're going to work that out, so y'all don't worry. We'll let you know as soon as we know something on that. September 10th, Diva Cookout at Emily's house, 5 p.m. Uh, all the laundry got back for RFK. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys for coming out to uh, tonight of worship like we talked about earlier. What a, what a blessing that was for us as we got to be up there. I swear I felt like I was on like a, a, like a hoedown, like it was awesome. There was hay bales, we had on like, it just, it just felt like I was on the Grand Ole Opry. And I always wanted to be on the Grand Ole Opry. So you guys made my dreams come true. I'm going to pray over this meal. You guys are going to head through that door. And you're going to go get lunch. If you do not have $5 to buy lunch, you go through that door and you get lunch. It does not matter. It is, hey, if you got 5 bucks, drop it in there. If you got 500 bucks, drop it in there too. But you know what? If you don't got 5 if you do not have $2 to your name, Go through there. I'm, this barbecue is great. Like, this isn't like we didn't run down and go grab it. This was just made right now. Everything's good. Bob's giving me the thumbs up. When Bob gives it the stamp of approval, you can take it to the bank. Let's pray over this real fast. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for these words. We thank you for your presence, and we thank you for your promise. And, Lord, you know what? We're even thankful for that process because that's how we get to where we're going. Bless this barbecue. I'm thankful for all the people that worked hard to bring this event together, Lord. But more importantly, I'm thankful for the folks that are about to go partake in it. What some generous people, Lord, sowing in to being a blessing to people in this community, people they'll never see, they'll never touch, they'll never talk to. But, God, they're providing them a meal, and when they come to get a meal, they get to meet you in the process, God. So we thank you and we praise you for this, for this wonderful, wonderful lunch. Be with my friends this week. Let them have a great week. We look forward to football season kicking off, God, and we're just excited. We're fired up, and we're ready to go. So bless this food in Jesus' name. Amen.